Good evening. Londoners should wear face masks on public transport as part of government plans to ease the lockdown. It's one of the measures that will come into effect from this Wednesday. While efforts are made to keep commuters safe, official advice remains for people to avoid tubes and buses. Our political correspondent Simon Harris has the latest. Rush hour London hasn't looked like this since before lockdown. Drivers approaching the Blackwall Tunnel found themselves in a queue of traffic. But if it was almost like old times above ground, below ground told a different story. Apart from a few early morning hotspots, the tube is largely deserted. It's the middle of the morning and I'm on the Piccadilly line in central London. There are fewer than half a dozen passengers on the entire train. In normal times, that would be unthinkable. Unthinkable, maybe, but as far as the authorities are concerned, they want it to stay like this, because half-empty carriages are the only way passengers can keep two metres apart. So today, the government published its latest guidance. Everybody, including critical workers, should continue to avoid public transport where possible. And government is now advising that people should aim to wear a face covering in enclosed spaces where social distancing is not always possible. Where you can't keep your social distance, for example, using public transport, wear non-medical facial coverings because that stops you spreading the virus, particularly if you're pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. And, and, and because the government's changing its guidance, we'll also be issuing uh, our transport staff also with basic face masks too. The transport unions have been calling for protective equipment like face masks for weeks. More than 40 Transport for London workers have died since the start of the outbreak. The majority are bus drivers. Lorraine Robertson, who works in Croydon, has lost two former colleagues. I think about it day and night. I think about if I've got, if I'm carrying it, if I'm going to pass it on to a fellow bus driver. So it is frightening times for a lot of us, and I think we all feel the same. You know, it is, it, we are frightened to come to work. The mayor is hoping commuters will continue to avoid trains and buses and instead walk to work or cycle. Not everyone can. On this construction site in Clerkenwell, most workers we spoke to were relaxed about using public transport. I keep the distance, use the masks, and I feel all right. Everyone's keeping their distance. So it seems quite safe. I'm not going to do it at the moment, it's too risky, so that's why I'm going to start driving. After seven weeks of lockdown, the underground of old seems like a distant memory. The crowds of commuters will return, but no one knows when. Simon Harris, ITV News, South Kensington. So what else was in the government's advice published today? Well, from Wednesday, you can meet with one person not part of your household if you're outdoors and social distancing. You can play non-contact sports such as golf or tennis with someone from outside your household and you can drive to an outdoor place irrespective of distance if you adhere to social distancing when you arrive. Well, Simon is here to look at these announcements in more detail. And Simon, changes for the capital, but the mayor is keen to stress that the lockdown continues. Yes, certainly changes for the capital. The scientists advising the government have concluded the risk of infection outside is significantly lower than catching it inside, which seems to be the green light if you want to go and sunbathe on Hampstead Heath or drive out to Epping Forest for a walk, providing you stay two metres away from anyone you don't live with. But the message from the mayor is, as far as he's concerned, London is still in lockdown for the next three weeks, which means he won't be reintroducing the congestion charge or the ultra-low emission zone charge in the next until at, next, at least three weeks, which means people can still drive into London without paying a toll. But the mayor is going to give the go-ahead for work on uh, Crossrail to restart. All right, Simon, thank you. Campaigners against HS2 in West London had feared that lockdown would mean it would be easier to evict them from their protest camp because there are fewer of them on site. And early this morning, they were woken up by enforcement officers. Our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. Tom Dalton wasn't going without a fight. He put his arm into a steel cylinder known as a lock-on tube and then cemented himself into the ground. It worked for a while before he was finally prized out by the eviction team. So they had to cut the whole thing, like a big hole around it, prize out with a crowbar. Uh, took them like three hours, I think. Was it worth it? Yeah. They come in exactly where we thought they would. Ow! Ow! It was nice and predictable. This was the moment filmed by one demonstrator when the evictions began. 
Environmental campaigners opposed to HS2 have been living in a series of camps and tree houses at Harefield in West London for several months. In recent weeks, most have been squatting in a disused car workshop. The protesters have been expecting this ever since the start of lockdown. The stay-at-home ruling saw their numbers dwindle, leaving just a handful occupying the workshop and the woods. Three weeks ago, they told us they were worried HS2 would take advantage of the lockdown. It really is down to numbers and we just cannot get the numbers here because of the, the lockdown. Today, Mark Keir's prediction proved accurate. We first heard uh, people shouting, they're here, they're here, um, and that was about quarter to five this morning. When they were coming, I dived in where I was sleeping and started packing my things up because my plan was always to get out. And they came in, started kicking my door, and I shouted to them about three times that I was packing my stuff up. They didn't need to do that. Shouldn't you be at home anyway with coronavirus? This is our home. This is our home. We've been living here so where for where will last... you go now? <sighs> I don't know. In a statement, HS2 said, this is land that is legally possessed by HS2. Protests such as this are costly to the taxpayer and are a threat to the security and safety of the public and our workers. At least two of the protesters tried to frustrate the eviction by putting themselves out of reach. It's lovely, yeah. Lovely place to be. But a treetop vigil isn't very sustainable without food and water, and the eviction teams were content to wait. The protesters also seemed in no hurry to go anywhere, or indeed to practice social distancing. Simon Harris, ITV News, Harefield. Good evening. After more than seven weeks of being told to stay at home, today the government was encouraging those who couldn't work from home to go back out to work. But apart from a few busy flashpoints, there were no surging numbers on public transport. And one of the main concerns, though, was how few passengers followed government advice to wear face masks, as our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. A bus stop at Elephant and Castle. Seven passengers get off, two get on, and only one of them is wearing a mask. Many Londoners seemed unwilling to embrace the new government safety guidelines telling us to cover up. At North Acton Tube Station, a large number of early morning commuters on the central line also chose not to bother putting on a mask. Wearing a mask or face covering on public transport isn't compulsory, but it is now official government advice when social distancing in confined spaces isn't possible. And that is increasingly likely to be the case as the lockdown rules are eased and more and more Londoners return to work. I wear gloves and my, my mask to go out. I think more safety for everybody. I think I even had this virus and I got cured, <laughs> so I'm all right now. I don't wear masks. <laughs> I don't really feel the immediate, like the, yeah, the immediate fear of, I guess, death. This was a clearly busy bus in Wembley. I think that, you know, in the weeks ahead, uh, Londoners want to do the right thing. They want to protect other people, and that's what a face covering will do. It will take a little bit of time for people to get used to it, but as we see more people returning to the tube network and the bus network, um, I think it will become the socially acceptable thing to do. OK, I'm on the Jubilee line now. Irfan Ahmed used the tube today to get to Guy's Hospital, where he works as a radiologist. Still very quiet on the tubes. Plenty of room to socially distance, plenty of empty seats around. Initially, I was a bit apprehensive. Obviously, I was worried there'd be a huge surge in the numbers of people on the tube, but I was able to socially distance. So actually, thankfully, it turned out OK. London Underground said there were 63,323 journeys on the tube between 7 and 10 a.m. That's an increase of just 4,148 on last Wednesday. A year ago, there were more than a million journeys. The Prime Minister called on Transport for London to run more trains. We're working very actively uh, with TfL uh, to ensure that we have more capacity, we discourage people uh, from going uh, to work during the peak and that the operators, in particular uh, TfL, lay on uh, particularly more tubes, uh, more tube trains, uh, when those are necessary throughout the day. There were some hot spots, like overcrowding on the Victoria Line when a passenger was taken ill, leading to delays. Some roads were a little busier. But on day one, the great return to work appeared to be more of a trickle than a surge. OK, Simon, it seems like the calm before the storm, maybe, but there has been an announcement in the last hour in the daily briefing on construction. Yeah, one of the ways to minimise overcrowding on public transport is to persuade employers 
to change the start times for people who work for them, in other words, to stop them travelling during the rush hour. Well, the government has just announced a big relaxation in the rules for building sites. It means in some areas, uh, building workers, construction sites can go on until 9 o'clock at night, or in others, even work throughout the night. I'm allowing sites to apply to extend their working hours, again with immediate effect, to 9pm, Monday to Saturday, in residential areas, and beyond that, in non-residential areas, and setting out a very clear government position that these applications should be approved by local councils unless there are very compelling reasons not to do so. Many construction workers do rely on public transport, so this could help ease pressure, ease congestion. And of course, as far as the government's concerned, it's another way of helping to jumpstart the economy. All right, Simon, thank you. Good evening. As more people across the capital continued their tentative steps out of lockdown and headed back to work, the Mayor of London issued a stark warning. Sadiq Khan said on LBC Radio this morning if he didn't get a bailout from the government, he would be forced to make cuts to the tube and bus networks. He says more than £3 billion is needed to balance the books for Transport for London, but his opposition have accused him of playing politics. With the latest, here's our political correspondent, Simon Harris. A quiet afternoon on the buses in the West End. With no shoppers, there are even fewer passengers than usual. Could some of these services soon disappear? London's mayor issued an ultimatum to ministers today, warning bus and tube services in London would be cut unless the government gave Transport for London a huge financial bailout. The only way to balance the books is to cut services. So ironically, at a time when the government's wanting us to increase services, ramp up services, to get into the recovery phase, we may be required to cut services because the government is failing to give us the grant support we desperately need. TfL's coffers have taken a huge hit during lockdown. According to City Hall, the organisation has lost 90% of its income from fares, advertising and the congestion charge. Yet it's still spending £600 million a month to keep the trains, trams and buses running. Transport for London is obliged by law to have an emergency fund. It's enough to keep it running for two months. But at the beginning of May, it started to eat into that £1.2 billion cash reserve. In a statement, the government said we are in advanced negotiations to agree a funding and financing package which will support Transport for London. Clearly, we will not prejudice these discussions by providing details of those negotiations at this time. The coronavirus is not the sole cause of TfL's hardship. It's been four years of failure on the mayor's part. A fares freeze that didn't work, spending all over the place and cancelling projects. The mayor needs to step up. Going back, there was always a black hole in TfL's budget and we can look at things like the mayor's decision to freeze fares. But nobody could have predicted the situation we're in with this pandemic. And when 90% of their revenue has been taken away overnight with people not travelling, with advertising down and so on, you know, it's not fair just to blame one individual. The mayor said TfL needed a lifeline from the government by the close of play today. It was, said one source, crunch time. Oh, Simon, crunch time indeed. What happens now? Well, look, Rizzo, in the last few minutes, the Transport Secretary has told the Daily Downing Street news conference that he was optimistic about a settlement with TfL, but he gave a hint about what it might involve. The government has long been critical of Sadiq Khan's partial fares freeze and Mr Shapps hinted that any deal to bail out TfL might have to involve fares going up. Sadly, I have to stand up and do them um, uh, each year, um, fares do end up having to rise with inflation, otherwise everyone knows there's less money going into the system. Uh, and if you have consistent fare freezes, it means that um, more money isn't going into the system. Um, and you can't then have an unfair settlement where other uh, British taxpayers are effectively uh, bailing out the system, albeit that the system in this case uh, is in trouble because clearly of uh, coronavirus. The mayor was pretty clear that unless TfL got a deal by the close of play today, we're talking five o'clock this evening, then they would have no uh, option but to put the brakes on spending and ultimately that could lead to cuts in services. Well, I've just heard from City Hall that they think a deal has been agreed, but we're not likely to know the details for several hours. All right, Simon, thank you.